The Susquehanna River begins in New York at Otsego Lake and flows down through Pennsylvania into Maryland, where it empties into the Chesapeake Bay. This large river has always been important to the people of the region, with its bankside being inhabited for thousands of years. The Susquehanna is named after the Susquehannock Native American tribe, who are also called the Conestoga by the English. They belong to the Iroquoian language family. Susquehannock is believed to mean people of the Muddy River. However, before the Susquehannock came to the southern Susquehanna River, tribes from the Algonquian family inhabited the region and made use of the Bountiful River. The Susquehanna River contains a fascinating remnant from long ago, as several of its small rocky islands have ancient petroglyphs etched into them. It is the petroglyphs at Safe Harbor in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which we are going to explore. Hey guys, I'm out on Journal Tales' very first archaeological adventure. The art etched into the rocks here is believed to be from the Algonquian tribe because of the similarity among the iconography. These petroglyphs are believed to be approximately 800 to 1,000 years old. When the dam at Safe Harbor was built between 1930 and 31, it caused massive yet predictable flooding above the dam, which inundated Walnut Island and Crestville Island. Some of the rocks on these islands were removed before they were flooded over. The Walnut Island petroglyphs were quite different from the Algonquian looking ones on the other islands. These unique and mysterious petroglyphs are similar to ones found in another island, which was swallowed by dam water in Conowingo, Maryland. That site is called Baldfriar, which is also on the Susquehanna. Although the construction of the Conowingo Dam caused that petroglyph island to be flooded, some of the petroglyphs were saved by dynamiting them out of the rock. On September 19, 2020, my friend Joachim and I set out from Baltimore, Maryland in search of the petroglyphs on the big and little Indian Rock Islands near the Safe Harbor Dam. It was a stunningly beautiful day with golden sunlight and a crisp, cool breeze. We unloaded our kayaks at the Conestoga River Access and paddled out to the Susquehanna. Having never been here before, we didn't know what to expect. The Susquehanna is known for being both serene and at times treacherous. We prepared for what we imagined might be the worst, but we were received in the arms of the Susquehanna with peace and a mild current. What we were unprepared for was the scavenger hunt which was about to begin. It was here that Google Maps led us astray. The water level must have been different when the satellite image was taken because what was supposed to be a few small rocky islands was actually probably well past 100. Additionally, the coordinates on Google Maps, which were labeled Big Indian Rock Island, turned out not to be accurate. For the next two to three hours, we paddled back and forth among the scattered rocks, sometimes just rowing by, sometimes leaving our kayaks, precariously teetering out of them unprofessionally. It was a glorious day with a cloudless blue sky, but alas, the glyphs remained elusive. So, island number two, still no glyphs. I didn't want my shoes to get wet, and apparently I'm incapable of kayaking without getting my feet wet. And my sandals are too slippy to be climbing around on these. So I'm barefoot. And there's my friend Jakima all the way over there. Helping me look. So island number four, and the only glyphs we found were pop marks, like little holes. So I guess we gotta keep looking. Finally, at last, about half a mile away from where we thought we should be, was Little Indian Rock Island. Island 473, we found it. Aside from the small indents found on one of the other rocks, these were our first petroglyphs. The first one to stick out to me was a goat, followed by what I thought resembled something like a banana. I knew it couldn't be a banana, but later I would find out how far off I was. After doing some more research, I found out later that this is believed to have been the symbol for Manitou, the primeval force behind every animal, plant, and rock in Algonquian spirituality. We left Little Indian Rock Island before we learned the secret to seeing the petroglyphs in their full detail. 
by lightly spreading water atop the surface with a sponge so the depressions remain dry and stand out against the darkened stone. We would figure this out on our next island, Big Indian Rock Island, just a bit further south. This was one of the easiest islands to disembark on, and it was also the biggest. The top made a large flat perch from which to overlook the river. A powerful storm must have flooded the region at some point because a huge weathered tree has been deposited on top, far above the water's surface. We came with admiration and respect for the ancient people who created these beautiful carvings. The various languages of the Native American tribes of the northeastern United States fall into two family groups, Iroquoian and Algonquian. It is thought that the petroglyphs here are Algonquian, although exactly who made them is unknown. There are many Native American tribes that live within the Algonquian language group, and they live throughout the United States. These tribes include, but are not limited to, the Powhatans, Wampanoags, Mahicans, Cheyennes, Ottawas, and the Leni Lenape. The Leni Lenape were later called the Delaware Nation. The mysterious Shanks Ferry people also lived alongside the river here, but little is known about their culture. Early in their history, they had a distinct material culture, but later they began to merge with Susquehannock styles. The Algonquians used bows and arrows for hunting game and spears for fish. Some of their biggest farming crops were corn, beans, and squash. They made white and purple shells into tiny beads to string up as wampum, a form of decoration and currency. The pictures which were woven by the shell beads told stories and were used for family designations. They wore moccasins and leather clothing and lived in log houses. One of the major battles with the incoming Europeans involved land, for which the Algonquians had no concept of ownership in the way that the Europeans did, and they did not believe the land could either be bought or sold. An interesting example of Algonquian mythology is from the Leni Lenape's origin story. It begins with their distant ancestors climbing up a hill to escape a rising flood. However, the rains were too heavy and the flood continued to rise. A great turtle, Taakox, who was hiding under the hill, rose up and upon his back the people were saved. The story of how Leni Lenape arrived on this continent is recorded in the Wallam Olam, an oral tradition which was eventually written down on wooden strips in mnemonic glyphs. In this story, it is said their ancestors used to live in a frozen landscape far away and then journeyed to what would become the northeastern United States. The clans that immigrated were the Munsee, or Wolf Clan, Unami, the Turtle Clan, and Una Laktigo, the Turkey Clan. I didn't want to leave when we turned our kayaks northward to begin the journey back upstream. The river felt magical. There in the wide open valley, these little islands seemed to make a sacred space. The rocks standing in the life-giving water remain silent except to those who come seeking their stories. Here is a place to call the ancestors forward and speak the tales of time.